Good morning, Ashford Church family and friends. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water run the blood from thy wounded side flowed. Be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for trust. Helpless look to thee for praise. Fall I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, thy. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, will the world so renowned see the on thy judgment throne? Rock of ages, glad for me, let me hide myself in thee. So to us alone, see the on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. It's time for today's message, part four of our Action Sermon Series. Today's message is titled, The Unapologetic, Unabated, Unstoppable Gospel of Jesus Christ. So each week as I study the text for the upcoming message, I actually get new insights about the text I preached the previous week. And so last week we talked about the miracle with the lame man at the beautiful gate. The title of that message was Raised Up to Praise Up. Peter and John are on their way into the temple to pray, and they encounter a man who had been lame from birth. He's begging for money. But Peter tells the man, I don't have any money. I have no silver or gold, but I'm going to give you what I have. And so he says, in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. And yeah, the man got up and walked. In fact, he followed them into the temple. The Bible says, praising God. It was a beautiful thing that happened at the beautiful gate that day. But one commentary writer suggests that the most important thing that happened that day was not the miracle at the gate. So remember how Jesus uh, tells his disciples to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth? And remember that on the day of Pentecost, Peter would preach what would be the very first gospel message. And the Bible says 3,000 people joined the church that day. And then remember, prior to the miracle at the beautiful gate, uh, Acts 2 talks about how all the worship, the teaching, and the fellowship the people were engaging in was pretty much confined to homes. It was homebound. And now we're beginning to witness a gospel message that has some forward motion out the front door of the house into the streets of Jerusalem. And some of that motion has caused a commotion and it's causing some friction among the Jewish leaders. 
One thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ is we should never leave home without it. We should take the word of Jesus, the name of Jesus with us wherever we go. And Peter and John did exactly that. And after that miracle with the lame man, Peter is going to take the opportunity to preach another message. You can read about it in Acts chapter 3 beginning at verse 12. This time he's going to point out the fact that the power behind the healing, the power behind that miracle wasn't his power. It wasn't John's power. It was the power and authority of Jesus Christ, who, by the way, he points out, pointing to the crowd, you had Jesus crucified instead of a known murderer. Jesus did nothing. He tells them that what they and the Jewish leaders had done was out of ignorance, and then he called them to repent, to turn to God, and be forgiven. Well, everyone in that crowd, namely some of the temple leadership team, uh, didn't take to the message too well. They did not find their hearts strangely warmed, in the words of John Wesley, following that message. And so Peter and John end up in custody. They were arrested. They spent the night in jail. But many hearts were strangely warmed that day. And that's the point that the commentary writer is making when he says that the most important thing that happened that day was not the miracle. You see, the miracle got the folks' attention, but it was the message, Peter's message, that led them to be saved. And now we go from 3,000, the Bible says, to 5,000 people saved. If I had been there that day, I would have suggested to Peter that he ought to titled his message, what I've titled mine today, the unapologetic, unabated, unstoppable gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to serve. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come before your people to proclaim your word. Now, Lord, please, may everything I'm about to say and do be inspired and instructed by the Holy Spirit so that your truth and nothing but your truth is spoken, received, and believed in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to use as the backdrop for uh, today's message, Acts, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 22, and this is the New Living Translation. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priest, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. See, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead like that. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it, so the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, along with Cephas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, By what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man who you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right among them, there was nothing the council could do. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. What should we do with these men, they ask each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. 
But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, it seems that Peter and John have stepped on some toes at the temple. Verse 2 there in chapter 4 says, The priests, the temple guards, the Sadducees were very disturbed to be blunt about it. They were PO'd about what Peter and John had done. You see, the priests and the Sadducees, along with the Pharisees, they would typically occupy the role of teachers. And now these apostles have commandeered the classroom and having great success. In fact, that great success landed them in jail for the night. And so the next day, as we read, they brought uh, back before the leaders. They're asked, uh, you know, how they were able to make the lame man walk and what was the point that they were trying to make. Well, anyone and anything that threatens the authority of the chief priest was going to be a problem. And now there's a problem. I mean, it was bad enough that the Roman authorities were already emasculating their leadership role. And now you've got these uh, two uh, uneducated, untrained men healing somebody. Well, they could not deny what had happened. I mean, the formerly lame man was standing right there. The problem was that they sentenced Jesus to death for being a blasphemer. Hear this now. Jesus got sent to the cross, accused of being a blasphemer. And now you got Peter and John just healing a man in the name of this so-called blasphemer. And that's what has these chief priests and other officials so upset. Is this what we should be doing is what the chief priests are thinking. Should we really be arresting them? The word is getting out. This is causing quite an emotion. And if this thing gets out any further, then our credibility is going to be shot. Well, since uh, Peter and John had not broken any laws, all they could do was to order them never to do anything like that again. Never do anything else in the name of Jesus. But Peter... But Peter refuses to deny what he saw Jesus do and what Jesus instructed him to do. You cannot stop, Peter must be thinking, the unapologetic, unabated, unstoppable gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, clearly, Peter has moved past his season of denial now. He had denied Jesus Christ three times before he went to the cross, but not anymore. He is not about to deny Jesus again, not post-resurrection, not after what he has seen and experienced. Peter has a Holy Spirit-produced boldness to preach, teach, and heal in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Had he kowtowed to the naysayers, had he uh, gone the other way, had he done what they told him to do, the gospel buck might have stopped right there in Jerusalem and never gone past the temple gates. So here's where our message begins today. All of that to say this. It begins with these questions. What does it mean for you to be a bold witness for Christ? And what does it look like for you to be a bold witness for Christ? Unapologetic. Are you unapologetic? See, we can't be afraid of what other people think about the gospel. We have to be unapologetic about our witness. We must be unapologetic about why we love the Lord, about who God is, what God has done, and what God will do.
Paul says in Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I am not about to be apologetic about my faith. I've seen God take time, money, and people out of situations and scenarios that conflicted with his will for my life. And you know what else? I've seen God add time, money, and people to the mix to ensure that his will in my life was done. And if he did it for me, he will do it for you if he hadn't already done it. See, God doesn't just want us to be nice and do nice things. All that is great, but God has really challenged us to do bold things so that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants us to reach for things that appear to be beyond our physical ability to grab. God wants us to see some things that are beyond the horizon and somewhere over the rainbow. And to believe that whatever we cannot physically see or touch, he can. He can. You know, here at Ashford, uh, we began a tutorial program, a bold move for this church. But if we want to keep the gospel message moving forward, we must do bold things. We're continuing to build our children and youth ministries because they're going to keep the gospel message moving forward, unapologetic about our witness. And the gospel is unabated. It never loses its power. Legendary gospel songwriter Andre Crouch uh, wrote a song a while back titled, The Blood Will Never Lose Its Power. The chorus says, it reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. What Christ did on the cross cannot be undone. It can't be undone. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It can't be separated. There's no place that we can go that God can't love us back from. Jesus never said that we would not get into trouble. He said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have tribulation, but take heart because I've overcome it. And so just stick with me. In other words, don't allow sufferings to catch you off guard. They don't catch God off guard. Uh, some of your suffering may be the result of your uh, determination to follow Christ, as a matter of fact. That just may be why you are suffering, because you love the Lord and you're willing to be bold and do what the Lord has called you to do and the enemy doesn't like that but there's peace in knowing that God's unabated love is unstoppable so in his uh, book unstoppable gospel living out the world changing vision of Jesus's first followers uh, author Greg Matt writes these words he says the church has long had an image problem and there have always been those willing to write the church off as a failed institution. Even some Christians want us to forget the church. But Jesus has not left that option open to us. He has made no provision for us to follow him while in isolation from other believers. Instead, he tells us, on this rock, I will build my church and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. The church is an unstoppable force powered by an unstoppable gospel. So the book of Acts uh, is really the story of the birth of the church and how the Holy Spirit would come along to uh, power the growth, empower the growth of the church and the spread of the gospel. It's taken some bold moves by some bold saints to keep the gospel message moving, to get us to where we are today. What bold moves 
are in you. What can you do? What should you be doing? What are you doing? And are you willing to keep doing them in order to make the church relevant, relatable, and reliable for such a time as this? The unapologetic, the unabated, the unstoppable gospel of Jesus Christ will transform the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we pray for you? We'd love to pray for you and your family. Send us an email to AUMC at askforumc.org. Our prayer team is standing by to pray for you and your family. Thank you for your continued generosity. If you'd like to share a gift with us, there are multiple ways to give. They're right there on your screen. In fact, we have six ways uh, to give. And one of those uh, includes uh, your presence here in the sanctuary. If you'd like to join us at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, we'll uh, worship the Lord at 11 o'clock. And then at the end of the service, if you would like, to, um, if you'd like to share a gift, uh, you can do so. Uh, Lord, I thank you for your word that has gone forward. I thank you, Lord, that your word never returns void. I pray that those that heard it, receive it, and believe it in Jesus' name. Bless the gifts and the givers. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today for our virtual service. You're welcome, as I said earlier, to join us in our sanctuary at 11 o'clock. We're at 2201 South Derry Ashford Road on the west side of Houston. Our children's ministry uh, is, uh, listen, we have some excellent volunteers here that uh, want to teach the Word of God to your children on a level that they can understand and comprehend. And ditto that for our Teen Quest minister as well. Bring your teens, bring your children, bring your family, and worship with us this Sunday. I send you forth each and every Sunday with three questions. I provide the questions. You know the answers. Who's the head of this church? Jesus. Who is the church? We are the church. And what are we as a church called to do? We're called to serve. God bless you. I love you. I'll see you next time.